right, this probably seems like a bit of a weird time to get angry about this, like 10 years on, but I just started thinking about Harry Potter again, and I remembered how much a certain writing trope annoys me. I hate it when writers kill characters at the end of their story. While I appreciate JK Rowling for giving me a ton of opportunities for dark humor in this video, I really must critique this writing style because much like a knife wound in a house elf, closure is vital. Oh yeah, we're doing this. So here's the thing, right? Character deaths can be great. They're effectively a bomb of condensed engagement. No, no, not making Fred explosion jokes yet. Shh, it'll come. Firstly, if you build up a lot of investment in your characters, killing them can create a huge emotional reaction in your audience. Secondly, it's great for spectacle, allowing you to create extreme moments with extreme reactions from your other characters as well. Side note, it was really cool how in the movies they at least gave Hedgewood like a, a like a moment to defend Harry as opposed to dying in her cage from a missed shot. Thank you, books. Thirdly, it creates tension. You can prove as a writer that you're not messing around, and there's going to be tension for every future dangerous scene now because of it. Fourthly, it effectively creates a new conflict, that being an inner conflict and arc in how other characters are going to move forward without them. And fifthly, and perhaps the biggest thing, is that they offer change. Depending on how important the character is to the story, a death can force your audience to radically reevaluate where they thought the story was going, and have them excited to learn what will happen now that the world is changed for good without that character. Now that I've laid that out, You'll notice that if you do this, at the end of your story, you get like, uh, two and a half of these. If you haven't killed characters before, you only get the tension effect for what's left of your story, which isn't much. In the same vein, there's not much of your story or plot left to be affected by the change of a character death, and you have zero time left to deal with the whole inner conflict arc of characters getting over a death. What's worse is that inner conflict arc isn't just like bonus engagement if you can do it, it is a necessity at the end because you ruin the closure of the ending if characters end the story while unhappy or still in conflict. This is the big reason why Harry Potter's time skip ending feels lackluster, because you created an inner conflict and then time skipped the whole grieving process to get that happy ending, but none of your audience saw how they moved on, so it just feels false. To be fair though, it didn't seem like JK was gonna do it even if she had time. Did you know Hedwig is mentioned like twice after she initially dies? Twice! Yeah, once when an owl hoots and he's reminded of her, and once when he wishes he could have died with her near the end of the story. I, I'm starting to think JK Rowling was like, like making an owl joke. Like Hedwig? Who? Did, did we not want to like mourn Hedwig at like any at any moment? W was Hedwig just trying to warn us about how fast the pacing was going to be? I.e. terminal velocity? Now I'm not saying you should never kill characters at the end. What I am saying is that engagement created by a character death must outweigh the side effects of that death. This is what I often call the side effects of slaughter. It's not just about ruining closure. If a character was well liked or created a lot of good moments or people are excited to see where they're going, a character death may only be good for shock value and just make your audience less excited for the future without them. This is why you can also have this effect in stories that haven't ended yet but are particularly bloodthirsty and rely on this tactic too much. There's a manga I've been reading recently that does this, but just by saying it, its name would be like a spoiler, so I'll talk about that specifically another time. But to generalize, in those stories, the whole plot tends to feel like a revolving door where characters are introduced and invested with the audience purely to kill off shortly after. Often these character deaths don't feel big or important, they feel disappointing because the plot was prevented from getting deeper and more complex with more characters the audience loves. And the future the audience expected for those characters seemed like it would have been more engaging than the future without them. This is especially noticeable when characters mourn for a short time and then never brought up again. Freddy- Fred is literally never brought up again after his death. I, I could I could literally make a joke eulogy and it would provide better closure than what the book did. Poor Fred. He left Hogwarts the same way he entered, hitting his head on brick. Look, if it makes you feel any better, comedy is my coping mechanism. A character death can be a lot of things, but it should never be disappointing, and the best character deaths are planned enough that they continue to affect the story for a long time after they're gone. This is perhaps the biggest difference between good character deaths like Dumbledore and serious and bad character deaths like Fred, Tonks, Lupin, Hedwig, Dobby. Jesus Christ, I <laughs> never thought I'd make a comparison between George R. R. Martin and J.K. Rowling, but it was, it was literally there the whole time. Deaths like Dumbledore give a lot of time for reflection and closure and through things like Dumbledore's plan to die, the Elder One that was buried with him, and his family who you meet and learn more about after his death. It doesn't feel like the world or plot got any smaller because of his death, but you still got all the shock from it and the fallout and the reactions when it happened. 
Remember how Harry, like, trashed Dumbledore's office in a fit of rage after Sirius's death? Remember him desperately trying to find a way to speak to him through a painting or a ghost? Remember how Sirius and his family name still plays an element in the story through the inheriting of Creature, the house elf, who's in part blamed for Sirius's death, but forms a bond with Harry over time? Remember that adorable scene between Harry and Luna, and how they bond over the people they've lost? Why would JK think that stopped being necessary? If Fred's death happened in the middle of the series, you would have had pages and pages on getting over him and how the world and his brother were changed without him to give his death closure and meaning. You know how I know this? Because more time was dedicated to Cedric fucking Diggory than was to Fred. Cedric is mentioned 42 times in the following book. Fred isn't mentioned once after his initial death. We got to see Harry and even Cedric's ex Cho Che complete a full grieving phase of the Order of the Phoenix, but we didn't see this for George. So if you needed it here for Cho fucking Chegg, why would you need it any less for George just because it's the last book? I want to see George make like a line of Weasley Wizard Weezes products dedicated to his brother. I want to see him start getting along better with uh, Ron as they bond over their brother. Maybe Ron can pull some pranks back on George so he doesn't feel like he's lost as much. I don't know. A, a good character death should make your audience go, I didn't want that character to die, but at least we got X seen because of it. This makes me go, I didn't want that character to die, but at least the books are over now so no one else will- Don't you fucking dare touch that phone, I swear to fucking god. Even Snape who dies at the end gives engagement that outweighs his death through a twist and the context behind his actions. He also didn't really need as much closure up until this point as he's a villain and no one was really rooting for a happy ending for him until after he died. But all of this is far far removed from the deaths like Lupin and Tonks who are by far the worst offenders. Good old Tonks had the magical ability to change how she appeared but apparently not if she appeared because she died off screen. What? Both her and Lupin seriously die off screen. So unlike any of these other deaths, the only benefit you get is literally the reactions from other characters and you don't even see their reactions to the death actually happening. What was the point in an off screen death? Oh, I know, maybe it was just one of JK Rowling's shenanigans and she was actually just trying to subtly explain to the reader that Lupin and Tonks were actually into having threesomes because Wow, did the third person fuck them! So, so typically if you ask people why these deaths were necessary, one of two things comes up. Either people wax poetic about some highly interpretive metaphor of what the death means, or they'll say it's about realism. It's a war, so people die. Alright, okay, firstly, it's also realistic for characters to cough, use the bathroom, start their speech, and forget what they were gonna say. That doesn't necessarily mean peppering it in randomly is conducive or necessary to good story. Hell, you know what's more realistic? That you mature more past 18 years old and you realize you didn't want to marry your high school sweetheart. That doesn't mean you should just time skip to Harry with a random stranger, which is exactly where JK didn't. Secondly, if you desperately want realism, use red shirts. Having nameless characters die allows you to show that there's death in an event without having to actually kill anyone who's actually liked, and it doesn't hurt your realism to coincidentally avoid named characters because with enough red shirts, the statistical chance of any specific character dying is actually pretty low. I think what it's really about, and why writers have a tendency to do this, is for the sake of adding consequence. It's about spectacle. An easy way to make your final battle feel climactic and big and like it matters is to slit a couple of throats. Create a bang, if you will. And that has merit, but it rarely outweighs what you lose. Especially if you could do this- Can, can you at least try? <laughs> But there are plenty of other ways to add consequence to a fight, especially the final fight. I think this is just what occurs to writers first because death is the first thing you think of when you think of war. Uh, spoilers for Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood and uh, Ratatouille. That's a combo. Sorry if I just spoiled that just by saying this, I, I just wasn't really a way around it. So I bring up these two because both of these have really great ways of adding consequence to the ending without strictly killing. Yeah, yes, one is a Pixar movie, but the point still stands. Wait, is it Pixar? Hang on, I'm, wait. <laughs> Hang on. Uh, rat, rat. This is actually genuine. Like, sometimes I say, like, oh, this is off script and it's actually totally on script. This is actually off script. Rat. It, it's Pixar, right? Man, I do not know how to spell Ratatouille. No, not the fucking dish. Ratatouille. 2007 film. What is it made by? Pixar? Pixar, right? I'm sure I didn't fuck that up. Yeah, Pixar. Okay, this was a whole... I don't know why I did this. Whatever. It's adding it. <laughs> Ratatouille has a fantastic ending to me, and what I've wanted to talk about for ages. You know why? Because everything changes, and yet there's still a happy ending. As a direct result of the final conflict in the movie, the food inspector finds out about the restaurant having rats in it and shuts it down. The restaurant was the whole conflict the movie was fighting over, and what one of the main antagonists was trying to actually achieve. The bad guy won. 
Also, Remy, the rat responsible for cooking, is insecure about never getting any credit uh, for cooking when Linguini, the main character, is getting all of it. But what also changed was the main characters impressed the other main antagonist, the food critic, with their cooking. And because Remy is insecure, they even reveal the secret to him about the rats, and it makes him totally change his attitude towards them. He then publishes a positive review, but because then it comes out that there's rats in the kitchen, he ruins his own reputation. Oh no, everything was for naught. So what happens? As a direct result of his character development, the main antagonist invests a ton of money for the main characters to start a new restaurant, an option that wasn't even available or even considered until now. Furthermore, Remy doesn't feel insecure anymore because he has someone who knows the truth now, and even has his rat family to help out as the new kitchen staff, so he doesn't have to disguise himself in the kitchen anymore. As a result, Linguini takes over as a waiter as he demonstrated having a knack for it in the final conflict. Absolutely perfect wrap up. The main conflict of the movie goes wrong, but out of the ashes of all the things that change, a new happy ending is built. Ratatouille's ending is perfect because it strikes a beautiful balance between the consequence of a final conflict and the closure of a happy ending. Unexpected, but happy. Another good example of a really well-rounded ending is Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood. I'll skip the lore, but the end result is basically that the main character chooses to sacrifice his magic to win. Great consequence, and because it's the end, and the conflict is over, the story doesn't suffer from a main character unable to use the magic system. In Brotherhood's defense, four characters actually die. There are two minor characters who would go out together, but uh, because it's so badass, and because they are minor characters, the engagement is well worth their death. One tries to sacrifice himself to blow up an antagonist and fails, but the other character, also dying of blood loss, makes sure his sacrifice isn't in vain by stabbing through him and using his body as a blind spot. The old man's death here is absolutely essential to achieving this moment, and the other character's death is important too because he promises to keep him company on the way to hell. What a beautiful moment! <laughs> also, this death plays into the arc of another important character. The other two characters are more major, but their deaths come with the tragic ironies that are heartbreaking, but still gives their deaths some level of closure. One character is the main character's father who's an immortal that finally achieves his goal after hating himself and his life for so long. In achieving his goal, he can finally die, but after his son, who hated him, finally called him father, he tragically finds himself wanting to stay alive longer. But after successfully achieving his goal and getting some sense of appreciation, he can go out with a smile. It hurts, right? It's not perfect closure, but the irony of his character finally dying only for him to want to stay is beautifully heartbreaking enough that I'd say it's mostly worth the death. The other character is an antagonist completely characterized by his greed. Like, like his name is literally greed. His whole journey as a character is him learning to value people rather than material gains and power. And by the end, despite dying, he basically says, it's okay, I never got those things. My friends gave me everything I could have wanted. Giving him tragic irony, but also a great sense of closure despite dying at the end. Why? Because he dies satisfied. And you can totally believe it too, because his whole character arc was about that realization. Also, worth mentioning, there's another conflict that resolves around clans fighting to find a Philosopher's Stone, and one clan does actually win in the end, but because of everything they've been through together, that character promises to use it to help the other clans, ensuring a happy ending for all of them despite the conflict. This is a great example of closure in an unexpected way, but also this is the character who had that greed character inside of him, and they were both fighting for control of his body. And when the other clan member says trying to help everyone is too greedy, he comments that greed has rubbed off on him, ensuring Greed's character is still relevant and has influence right up until the end. God, this scene always makes me cry. I looked it up for this fucking video. I just, eyes fucking just teared up. Fuck me. <laughs> I'm just trying to work, man. Didn't ask for this. God, anyway, hopefully this video has presented some case as to why you shouldn't treat your beloved creations too lightheartedly. As someone whose biggest turn on for writing was a creator destroying the lives of their beloved creations, I know how tempting it is to take the psychopathic approach. It feels like the bravest and ballsiest approach to writing, and there's a certain pride that comes with that. But now, I'm here to tell you as a change man that you should value your beloved creations more. Every one of them is special, carrying their own brilliant, sparkling potential, and you should protect them unless you can make it really worth it.